So this week we'll start with uh, community ecology and by definition, a community is the city of groups of individuals from different species in a given area that uh, is different than the population um, ecology definition, which was the study of the groups of individuals of a single species. Uh, so here we have coral reefs and they're showing uh, a bunch of different species of animals and uh, algae. And, and so what we're gonna do is we are going to go through um, some of the things that community ecologists look at. And we'll start with uh, interspecific interactions. Uh, so that will be our, our, our big chunk for this first one. All right, so I put together a table and this table may differ from what you see out there. Um, and what we want you to do is, is think about the interactions that two individuals can have. Uh, and typically they talk about uh, between species, which I, I don't like that much because there is some intraspecific um, also where, where it's within a single species. So we, we, will, we will talk about that a little bit, especially with the, uh, the first one competition. Uh, so looking at this table, uh, what you need to know is if you see a plus in the square, that means that that individual is benefiting from this interaction. Uh, if you see a minus, it means that it's losing something in this interaction. And if you see a zero, it is not affected by the interaction. So those are what those uh, uh, symbols mean. And so what we're going to go through is talk about each one of these. And the one that is uh, the second one down, exploitive, that has changed um, over, over time. Um, uh, a lot of these interact, uh, uh, interspecific interaction tables will show that as um, predation. And predation worked, uh, but I think people had trouble with that definition. So we're, we, we've gone to exploitive, and I'll explain that as we get there. Uh, the other thing I guess I need you to know as we do this, um, um, there are other terms for this table. Um, uh, symbiotic relationships is another one I've seen uh, in, in other books. So just, just to give you an idea. So, so really what you're doing is you're looking at two individuals uh, and how they are interacting and what they are getting from that relationship. So let's, uh, let's go through them. And again, we'll start with competition. Uh, and there is interspecific and intraspecific. So uh, um, watch those prefixes carefully. Uh, inter means between, uh, like an interstate is a, is a freeway that goes between states like the 10 freeway or the five. Uh, intra means within a single species. So um, for these pictures you're showing over here on the right, this would be interspecific. We have a African lion and we have hyenas and they are obviously fighting over something. Uh, my guess is some kind of prey item, could be territory, could be lots of things. Uh, below uh, on those two pictures, we have uh, intraspecific where we have two uh, males here maybe fighting over some of the females in the background. I don't know what the hell this guy's doing, but, uh, uh, but anyway, and then here we have two horses um, that are probably again fighting over territory and or a uh, female and, and so again competition. Um, if you go back to the table uh, people have kind of a strange way of looking at this is, is when you think about competing most people think that you're going to have um, um, a winner or a loser and uh, here we have both lose and I, I will tell you that yes in competition you, you, you do have uh, individuals competing, and then you do have um, a winner, I, I suppose, uh, but uh, the competition itself is actually making you lose. You are exerting energy uh, to get that resource, and, and so that is actually taking a, a toll. So that's why we have lose-lose on the competition. All right, so here is a statement I want to give you. Two species cannot occupy the same ecological list. This is called the competitive exclusion rule. And so my question to you is, is this true or not? Can two species occupy the same ecological niche? Uh, and in class, I would, uh, <laughs> would wait. And, and we, we may even have that discussion on, uh, on Monday. But, but what I need you to know is um, this is true. Um, although uh, it really has to do with a timetable. 
And so what that means is on the short term, maybe they can live in the same space, uh, but, um, and do the same thing. Um, but on the long term, that is not the case because if you have two species, uh, they are different. And if they are different and they're trying to do exactly the same thing, one is gonna be better at it and through uh, Darwin's natural selection, one should uh, take over and the other one should fade away um, unless the environment changes. Um, so here is a, a great example of um, the competitive exclusion rule. Uh, here, what we have is, and this was done by uh, Dr. Castro, who was actually over at Cal Poly Pomona. And so what they were looking at is how um, barnacles are living on, on the coast. Now, uh, a niche again is, um, in a third grade class, it'd be like kind of their job. Uh, what do they do? Uh, and, and so that works for us. And these guys are filter feeders. Okay, so uh, what's going to happen here is, is we have different types of niches. And I do want you to know these. There's a fundamental niche and a realized niche. Okay, a fundamental niche is the niche that you would use uh, if you had no competition. Uh, a realized niche is actually where you end up and what you actually do. Okay. Um, and so, for instance, I always, I always say, you know, I don't, I don't know how big a TV you have, you know, big sporting events coming up. Um, and, you know, uh, if there was no competition, you know, you just kind of walk around the neighborhood and go into the house and um, sit down and, and watch it on the biggest screen. Uh, that would be your fundamental niche. Now, uh, I don't know about your neighbors, uh, but I think if you just walked in, went into the refrigerator, sat on the couch, started drinking their beer, they probably have some something to say about it. So uh, uh, your, your realized niche is, is actually where you're going to watch it on your little 12 inch or 13 inch screen at home. Um, uh, so, so just kind of an example. So here what you're seeing is um, two different species. And what, um, what Castro actually did um, was go in and clear all the balanus off the uh, off the rocks. And what you actually saw was that these then uh, the, the uh, thalamus, thal I don't know if you to uh, pronounce that. What you saw was those actually uh, covered the rock all the way down to and into the ocean. Uh, now remember, this is a, a intertidal, so that water will come up and cover uh, at high tide all of those um, so they can feed. Um, so so what, what we're suggesting then is that the fundamental niche um, uh, for the um, for the uh, uh, thalamus is, is actually all the way uh, to the bottom. But the realized is because of competition uh, is up higher. Uh, Belenus, what you're saying is their fundamental niche and realized niche is the same because the uh, little guys can't outcompete them. Um, what stops uh, the Belenus from going any higher is desiccation, it is drying out. They're too large and they dry out too quickly, uh, where the little guys can close down and they can hold on to their moisture uh, better. Uh, so they will live up in that area that uh, Belenus can't do. Uh, but again, if you remove Belenus, they will, um, they will travel down. All right, so um, to reduce competition, this is what I want you to think about. So what happens is sometimes it's not better to fight. So what they do is they do what's called resource partition. Uh, here are some lizards in a forest. And what they do is they have picked these kind of micro habitats and this is where I'm gonna be found and this is what I'm gonna do and I'm gonna let you do your thing somewhere else. So you can see the cordii, they're up in the top trees and you can see that there are some that are living maybe just in the uh, the dead trees or fences. Um, and, and so anyway, there there is this, you stay there, I stay there, I'll eat these things, you eat those things, and that's resource partitioning. Now, um, if there is a shortage, let's say you came in and you took out um, all the dead stuff on the bottom, you know, the, um, I, would, I would argue that uh, this, um, this tickus probably would, would fight with maybe the sub, sub you Now, nobody wants to go extinct. Um, so there'd be a fight, no more resource partitioning. Uh, but, but at this point, what you do is, you know, you, you do your own thing, you live your own life, and, and you try to minimize competition. Over time, resource partitioning um, 
oh, I forgot. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's not just spatial, it's also um, temporal. It also has to do with, with time. And, and here we have two different spiny mice, or spiny mouses, <laughs> spiny mice, I suppose. Um, and the common one is nocturnal, and then the golden spiny is um, diurnal out during the day. And so again, they're resource partitioning. They're in the same habitat, one's out at night, one's out during the day. And it turns out, if you remove the nocturnal ones, um, the golden spiny mice will go nocturnal. That is probably what uh, their, their um, genetics tell them to be or, or what's best for them. But because of competition, they can't compete with the common. And that's why the ones are common. There's lots of them. Um, so the golden one will, um, you know, resource partition. Okay, if you're not going to use the night uh, or the day stuff, uh, we're going to do that. And, and, and so they have developed that way. All right. Uh, um, what what I also need you to know is once you resource partition long enough, uh, that's going to lead to something called character displacement. And what will happen over time, over generations, is you now see uh, changes in um, phenotypes. And so here is what we're showing you: is we have two different um, birds on the Galapagos. These are two of Darwin's finches. And you can see the beak depth on, on how long they are, or, or how, how thick they are, I guess. And it, it really is about um, seed size, these guys uh, eat seed. And what you're going to find out is when they are alone on the islands by themselves, uh, they kind of fit in that net 10 millimeter um, zone. That seems to be the best. Uh, but what they find is when they are found on an island together, um, there's competition. And so to kind of minimize that, what we've seen is the G. fortis um, beak has over generations moved toward the larger end, and the Fulganosa has, has moved toward the smaller end. Again, it is to reduce competition. Uh, I guarantee you uh, that if you were to remove um, one of those populations, uh, they would probably over generations again. It's not a beak shrinks or gets bigger, but over generations they would they would slide back into that ten millimeter average. All right, the second one is exploitation. Again, this used to be uh, predation, and and you can see the predators here: African lion, the hyena, and, and then we've got vultures coming in, and the zebra taking the map there. Um, so uh, uh, exploitation has been broken down into three different um, segments, and they all do the same. The first one is predation. So here's a bunch of predators. We've got a, a rattlesnake uh, eating a kangaroo rat. We've got a praying mantis eating something. <laughs> maybe maybe a bell praying mantis. Uh, hard to tell on that one. Uh, snowy owl taking a um, that is a, a, a teal. That's a duck. Um, and on the right is a, a red fox taking a squirrel. So uh, again, all, all predators taking prey items. Um, animal defenses. So animals have evolved ways of um, protecting themselves. So uh, mechanical defenses uh, would include shells like we have on the right there with the armadillo. Uh, you can think of tortoises and snails. All of those have shells and they have uh, mollusks like clams and oysters. And then we have horns, antlers, and quills. You know, horns and antlers, I figured you knew what they looked like. And then quills are just modified hairs like you'd see in a por por uh, porcupine. And everybody knows teeth. Uh, for chemical animal defenses, there are poisons, uh, like the poison arrow frog on the left. And then on the right, we have um, odors put out by skunks. And so uh, these are ways animals would defend themselves from predators. Um, other ways is coloration, uh, and we have two uh, different types. Cryptic coloration used for camouflage. Down on the bottom, we have two different animals. Uh, the one on the left is a poor will. Uh, this thing is laying in the, in the gravel during the day, comes out at, uh, in the evening and early mornings to feed on insects. Um, and they'll lay in, in a rocky area. They're very hard to see. Uh, here over here, we have what's called a horned lizard. You might have heard them called horny toads. They're not toads. Uh, they may be horny, who knows. Um, but yeah, so this guy is actually an ant specialist. And um, they, they also uh, live in kind of these gravelly areas because that's the, uh, the ants they prefer living. Okay, so this would be cryptic colorations, like camouflage. And then up here on the left, 
uh, top left here, we have a poison dart frog, and this is an aposmatic coloration. And so it's warning colors. If you are uh, poisonous, uh, you, you want to, or venomous, uh, you want to be, um, you don't want the animal that is attacking you to find out by dying that there's no learning involved. Uh, so what happens is they are putting up warning signs that they are dangerous. So if I go back, you can see the skunk, uh, black and white. And over on the bottom left, we have another poison arrow frog that is blue and black. Uh, what I want you to realize is they're not going to be a bright orange or they're not going to be a bright blue. And it's because uh, a lot of predators are colorblind. And so what you see in aposmatic coloration is two-tone. It's usually black or white, black or orange, black or blue, black or red. Um, again, uh, predators can see the contrast. Uh, they may not be able to see um, the color. All right, and uh, some more animal defenses. Uh, there's mimicry. Uh, and so what happens is up on the um, left, we have basin mimicry, where a harmless species mimics a harmful one. And so uh, on the top right, we have a venomous green parrot snake in the tropical forest. And on the bottom left, we have a hawk moth larvae. Um, that is actually not a snake. That is a, um, um, a hawk moth is a very large moth, uh, butterfly family. Um, and what it does is it swells its back end and it makes it look um, like a snake. And it actually will raise it up kind of like a snake would raise up. Um, so that would be Batesian mimicry because the, uh, the larvae is not harmful at all. Um, Malarian uh, mimicry is where you have two species that can be dangerous um, mimic each other. And here we have a, a, a cuckoo bee and a yellow jacket. Both of these have stingers. And you notice they, uh, you know, they look very similar to each other, that yellow and black look with the wings um, will tell uh, predators if they if they run into one and get stung they're going to figure out hey I need to avoid those uh, so it's a way to increase your uh, the information going out uh, without even having to be uh, attacked they're just more individuals that look like them. Um, so that's why uh, most bees do have that yellow and black uh, um, look uh, and again it's it's a, a way to let uh, predators learn um, what happens. There's also predator mimics. And down on the bottom, uh, there is an octopus that will mimic different things depending on what's around. So if it thinks it's going to be attacked, it can mimic a sea snake. Uh, sea snakes are venomous and things will leave them alone. Um, if it wants to bring in some prey item, uh, mimic a flounder. Uh, that's a, a, a bottom dwelling fish, a flatfish. And then on the bottom is uh, mimicking a stingray, which I don't think is quite as good as the others. Uh, but you know it's going to look more like a shark. Uh, again, might uh, might keep uh, other organisms or predators away from it. Um, all right. So the second one is herbiv herbivory, and, and again, technically they're predators, and we don't think of them that way. You know, um, you don't think of a cow as a predator. You know, it's always like uh, lions and tigers and bears on mine. But turns out, uh, uh, if you're a plant, these guys are predators. But because people had trouble with that concept. Uh, herbivory is now the term they use. And so here we have a bunch of um, caterpillars eaten on a leaf. Here we have a manatee and uh, uh, eaten seagrass. Uh, here we have a Cape buffalo. I believe that's a Cape buffalo um, eating some grass. And here we have a koala eating um, eucalyptus, which is uh, not eaten by a lot of things um, because of some of the chemicals inside it. So, um, so anyway, so again, if you are a plant, uh, uh, these, these technically would be predators. So uh, the new term is exploitative. Uh, so plant defenses, also um, mechanical and chemical. We have thorns and spines, which we see on cactus and euphorbia. Again, this would be, they're analogous to each other. Obviously this is a good defense strategy in the desert. If you're green, things want to eat you. And then we have poisons, different poisons that plants make. Uh, nicotine is actually a poison, and, and we decided to smoke it. Uh, who the hell knows what we do? Uh, strychnine, which comes from a strychnine plant in Asia, um, East Asia. And uh, we used to use that as a uh, poison, especially for rats. Very, very um, 
uh, poisonous as it's not really used anymore. Uh, morphine comes from coming from opiates. Uh, we use it as a painkiller in small amounts. Um, in larger amounts, it will stop you breathing. And then tannins, I, I threw that one in there uh, because tannins are actually in things that we, we know uh, oak trees have tannins, it's, uh, uh, local trees that to keep things from eating it. Um, actually, cherries have tannins in it. Um, uh, so you, if you eat a large amount of cherries, um, that could actually also cause issues. All right, and then the other one that goes under this grouping is parasitism. Uh, parasites are technically predators. Um, you know, they may not take you out, uh, but uh, they can harm you. Um, and so, and I guess I forget forgot to mention, obviously one wins, one loses um, in this uh, relationship. So here we have a mosquito uh, taking blood. You know, obviously the mosquito wins, you lose by, by, I guess, donating some of your blood and they do carry disease. Uh, over on the right is um, actually a, a camera inside a intestine, and what you're seeing is actually a, ta uh, a tapeworm, uh, and our tapeworm, there's actually several of them there, and, and so, um, yeah, they're, they're definitely predators. Um, on the bottom right is a, a bed bug, uh, you know, this is the thing now with, with going to hotel rooms and motel rooms. Um, and, and people's houses, I guess, when you stay over is bed bugs are predators that kind of hang out in bed and, and, and uh, uh, anything, um, you know, paper or, or linen cloth, and they suck blood at night. So um, you'll get bit at night. And then there are um, plant parasites. And on the bottom uh, middle, those are aphids. So again, an insect, but they're, uh, they're not sucking blood, they're sucking uh, sap. And plants and then on the far left is a parasitic plant uh, and if you see the orange strings there that is called dodder d-o-d-d-e-r and that is actually sapping the other tree they, they wrap around and uh, they're orange they don't really photosynthesize so um, they're using the sugars from the plant all right a couple more of these mutualism is where they both um get an advantage. And so on the left is the acacia tree along with uh, <clears throat> some ants. Uh, these ants uh, are pretty vicious and they sting. And so what happens is if a uh, predator or an herbivore comes over to eat this acacia, uh, what happens is these ants run over and attack it, sting it, um, and actually can keep other, they will chew other plants to keep the, the acacia clear for sunlight. Uh, and there's actually these little, um, bumps on here that put out a little bit of nectar for the ants. So the ants get food and um, they're not showing it here, but these things have huge spine, hollow spines that they live in also. Um, so the, the ant gets housing and food and then the acacia gets protection. Uh, the, the, probably the best example people know is, you know, Finding Nemo is the clownfish and the sea anemone. Uh, the sea anemone um, stings its fish and it will eat fish. Uh, it turns out that these guys rub against it and they have uh, something in, uh, uh, on their skin that, that causes the sea anemone not to sting them. And so what happens is they get a safe place to live. So if another bigger fish comes after them, they just come flying into the sea anemone to stay safe. And the sea anemone actually gets um, debris cleaned up from the fish and also um, other fish are drawn in uh, trying to catch the clownfish so they get food. And then the bottom picture, we have a, a alligator with a uh, bird, uh, bird inside its mouth, a crocodile, with a, with a bird, uh, um, a bird inside its mouth. And uh, uh, basically, uh, the crocodile is getting its teeth cream cleaned, and the bird is um, getting food. All right, and the last one is commensalism. And um, I'm not sure I agree with this. This is where one benefits and then the other one gets nothing from um, the behavior. And here we have a couple of different examples of birds and mammals. And the idea is that as the large animal walks around, things are scared up for food for the birds. So uh, insects and or whatever. And my argument with this is that it's not just the birds getting something from from this relationship um if you've ever seen something like this you know um 
you have all these birds around, uh, what you will see, if the birds take off, you will see the larger animals start looking around. Uh, because if the birds take off, there's probably something very scary around. And, and so I would argue that is kind of an early warning system for, for these larger animals. Um, I can't imagine that there is a <laughs> relationship uh, where you don't either get something out of it or get hurt. I mean, I'm just, maybe I'm cynical, but uh, <laughs> um, so, so I'm not convinced that the, this exists. The, the, probably the best example I've, I've heard of is the one on the bottom is barnacles that live on uh, whales. Uh, the, the barnacles get an advantage because they're out in the water, they're filter feeders and they're being taken all around to, to collect food. So that could be a, a huge advantage. Um, and a whale being extremely large, you know, you have a barnacle on your ass, how <laughs> much could it matter? Um, but reality is we have found that the ones that are heavily covered in barnacles uh, do show some health issues. And so that might, um, that, that actually might even be a, you know, a disadvantage. So, so again, uh, you know, I argue this may not exist, but if it does, this is probably one of the best examples I've seen. All right, and that will be the first recording.